for the moms who raised us up, gave us love, and made us strong. For the praying moms who don't always know what to do, but always know who to talk to. For the hurting moms who've loved and lost, but never given up. For those who never got called mom, but who cared for us all like a mom would. For the young moms who became moms sooner than expected and gave it all they had. For the single moms who tirelessly and courageously learned how to do this on their own. For the stepmoms and the stand-in moms who rose to the occasion and loved us well. For the working moms, the stay-home moms, the cooking moms, and the takeout moms, thank you. For teaching us how to walk, how to learn, and how to make a difference. For taking care of us when you barely had enough time to take care of yourself. For comforting us when we felt alone and afraid. For lifting us up when others put us down. For the rides, the meals, the laundry, and the birthday parties. For the years, tears, laughter, and love. It's not enough, but we wanna say thank you. Thank you for doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. We love you. We honor you. We remember you today. Happy Mother's Day. It is very important in this season, in this hour, that we recognize God for who he is. As born again believers, it is just mandatory that we recognize that God is a God that loves us. God is a God that takes care of us. God is a God who wants the best for us. And sometimes in this hour, I look around and I say, it's a lot going on, God. It's a lot going on, and we can't, as people of God, just stay locked up in the four walls of the church, turn off the news, just get on, you know, talk to our friends and talk to our neighbors, go walking and do whatever we do. It is time that we rise up and begin to be generation builders. We have to build the generation. Mothers have been given the task to train up and to raise up our children in the admonition of the Lord. And we do a good job at that. But sometimes, as we saw, we have disappointments. We have fears. We have things that come against us that sometimes make us feel like we're not that great of a mother or we're maybe not be that great of a father. But I'm here to tell you, if God created you and he gave you that position, you can be great. Amen. It is important. That on this journey, we learn to fear God. Hallelujah. I said we learn to fear God. Amen. Amen. If you would, I'm going to go through a couple of scriptures, and I want to talk to you about having courage in the face of fear. As a generational changer, you have to have courage in the face of fear. Amen. Over in Proverbs 31, 30, it says that charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Amen. And we know in the house this morning, okay, that we have women that fear the Lord. And the Bible says that you are worthy of praise. So give yourselves a hand again this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we love you this morning and we glorify your name, Lord. We thank you for this day, God. 
We thank you that this is truly the day that you have made. And we declare that today we shall rejoice and we shall be glad in it, Lord. We ask, God, that you will anoint me to minister forth your word, line upon line, precept upon precept, Father. I thank you, Father God, that your divine will will be done through this message, Lord. I pray, God, that you will give the hearers uh, a heart to receive what the Spirit of the Lord is saying in this hour, Father. And I thank you, Father God, that we will go forth being doers of what the word of the Lord says, Lord. That we will be generational changers, Lord God. Lord God, agents for you in the earth in this hour, Father. And we thank you that we will be careful to give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So over in Exodus chapter 1, starting at verse 15, it reads, The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Puah, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth, the delivery stool, if you see that the boy, baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwife arrives. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Now, just to give you a little bit of background history, this is a new pharaoh that has come, uh, and he is uh, intimidated by all of the people in Israel, and they're growing, the numbers are growing, the generations are just populating. And so he gets intimidated, so he calls unto the midwives. And over in uh, King James Version, it says, he called those that were of the office of a midwife. How many of y'all know that midwife is an office? Back in that day, they were mostly women who had not had children. They had time to dedicate, to be with those that were with children, to help them through the birthing process. Midwives gave encouragement. Midwives gave support. Midwives understood the birthing process. Back then, they didn't have epidurals. They didn't have painkillers. They had to have processes and procedures in order to make the birthing process easy. Amen? Midwives understood that it wasn't just about them on the day of birth having a baby, but midwives understood that they, she had to make sure that she was concerned about the emotional well-being of the mother because the emotional well-being had an effect on the child in her womb, praise God. The emotional well-being of the mother had an effect on everything concerning the birthing process, praise God. And so she was concerned. The midwife, she was concerned for her and she had a passion to do as she did. You have to be made up of something special in order to stand with somebody to give birth, to take them through that birthing process because that is a very painful process, praise God. That is a very dredging process. And so they spent time with the mother. They spent time with her so that they could understand the mother, so they can know what her strengths and her weaknesses were, praise God. And so we see here that the king, he calls the Hebrew midwife. Now, he is an Egyptian king. His first mistake was to call a Hebrew to kill another Hebrew's baby. <laughs> you know, it's something about women. We're going to take care of one another. Praise God. We're going to watch out over each other's children. We're going to make sure that no hurt, harm, or danger comes to our neighbor's kids, to the neighborhood kids. That's just who we are. Praise God. And so here you have a midwife, glory to God, who has been assigned, appointed by the king, Pharaoh, the leader of the, uh, of the uh, whole nation. He was the top authority figure. He tells them, I want you to make sure that you, when the, you see that woman on the birthing stool, when we talk about a birthing stool, I had to look that up. I was like, now what in the world is a birthing stool? And it says that it was two stones, praise God. There's some translations that said there was a thing that they sat on with a hole in the middle that they sit down on. And he said, when you see that process, when you see her sitting on the birthing stool, when you see her sitting on the stones, that indicated to me that that was the, the time when that baby was about to come forth, praise God. When they were on those birthing stones, that baby is about to come forth. 
And guess what? The mother never sees what the sex of the child is. Praise God. It is the person who is delivering the baby that sees the sex of the child. And so he's recognizing that you all are the first ones that identify, <laughs> glory to God, what the sex of this child is going to be. And so when you see it's a boy, I want you to kill him because he recognized that if he killed the male seed, that they would not be able to produce, that they would not be able to have the generational blessings that God had promised upon the children of Israel. He recognized that he would not be defeated if he could stop the male seed. There is power in the sea. Glory to God. There is power in the male sea because the male seed is what uh, causes us to produce. We are the ones that carry the seed, the women. Hallelujah. We carry the seed. We nurture the seed. We are the ones that cause the seed to grow and to develop. But if he could stop the male seed, he thought he had it made. But uh-uh. He said that these women, praise God, they feared God. It's something about a woman that fears God. You know, sometimes we get fear mixed up. We allow things to cause us to fear. We all have fear. We all have fear or have had fear about one thing or another. But one thing I know is that when you have the fear of God, when you have the fear of the true and living God, when you all have awe for him, when you have respect for him, when you love him, when you serve him, I'm telling you, God will take the fear, the natural fear away from you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It says that the Egypt the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? And then the midwives answered Pharaoh. They said, you know what? Hebrew women, they something else. They're not like Egyptian women. Mm -mm. They are vigorous. That means they're strong. They, 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 they just move fast. And we missed every one of them. Now, you know that's a bold-faced lie. You know, that's a bold-faced lie. And for them to speak to the king like that, they took a risk on losing their own lives. They took a risk on sacrificing their families from being destroyed. They made a decision that, you know what? I am going to fear God. And I am going to stand up against the odds of the powers that be. I am going to make sure that I see, they understood generational blessings. They understood that there was promises to the children of Israel, that those generations would be blessed. And they knew that if they cut off the sea, that the blessings would stop, praise God. And they were willing to take their lives. They were willing to lay down their lives for the sake of these unborn children. Glory to God. They said, you know what? These Hebrew women are not like like Egyptian women, they something else. Whew. I can only imagine if he only called Shepra and Pua, that's only two midwives. And I'm assuming that they were the head of all the midwives because women were having babies left and right back and then. That was his fear that m women were producing. They were bringing forth seed. And you know what? Shua, Chipra and Pua, they had to recognize that, okay, we got to come up with a game plan. So sometimes when the enemy tries to get you to do something or powers that be try to get you to do something, you got to make sure that you are connected with God. We need the wisdom of God to move out and to make decisions that are contrary to the powers that be. I'm not telling you to... Um, come against civil authority. I'm just saying, when somebody tells you to do something that doesn't line up with the word of God, then you have a right to deny it. You have a right to say no. You have a right to do what needs to be done. Glory to God. These midwives, they were amazing. Glory to God. I think about my son, Daniel. Jeremy, y'all heard about Jeremy. He's my first born. I believe for supernatural childbirth for him. I didn't want to have any pain. I was super deep, and I was not going to have no pain. I listened to these CDs over and over. I've told y'all this story before, and it just didn't work. I had absolutely no pain because I yielded to the epidural. See, midwives don't play that. Midwives say, you know, if I walk with you all this way, then you're going to go through the pro birthing process. You're going to go through the natural way that God has ordained for you to have a baby. And so, okay, I did that. So second baby, Daniel, I got me a midwife. I got me a midwife. I said, I'm going to do this again. This time I'm going to do it natural because I didn't feel a thing. The epidural took all the pain away. So I get a midwife. Her name was Lane. She was amazing. Not only did she care for what was in my womb, she checked me, she checked my vitals, but she spent time with me. She was a midwife that made sure that my emotional well-being was good, that my physical well-being was good. She made sure that I ate right and I did the right things. But not only that, she was a spirit-filled woman of God. She was a woman of God 
God that loved God, that loved doing what she did. And she made sure that spiritually I was growing in the midst of the process. And I remember when it was time to have Daniel. Daniel was a big baby. And I said, Lord, okay. You know, I knew he was growing and I had gained all this weight. And I was like, okay, how am I going to make it through, through this pregnancy? And, and Lane called me and she said, you know what? I am so sorry. I'm not going to be able to be at the delivery. I have had an emergency to come. And she knew it was days before I was supposed to deliver. And I said, what? You're not going to be there? Pastor Doug could tell you, first thing I did when I got in that hospital, got me an epidural. And guess what, y'all? It barely worked. I felt no pain the first time. The second time, it was like drudgery. I said, what? they didn't give me enough. They didn't give me what they gave me last time. Well, I need some more. I need some more. And I went through that birthing process. But I believe that Lane, my midwife, was praying for me. That I wouldn't, uh, the double door wouldn't take. That I would have to go through the birthing process. And I did with Daniel. He was a 9.6 baby. So you can't even imagine what that was like. But I look at these midwives and I recognize that they told a lie. And we know God hates liars. We know that God hates lies. But guess what? In this situation, they told a lie, but God honored their lie. Praise God. Because the lie that they told was to save a generation of men. Glory to God. To save a generation of men. I think about Rahab in the Bible. She lied too. You know, the Bible full of lying women. But she lied and she said, you know, spies, they're not here. She was a prostitute. I'm like, why do spies go to her house anyway? They go to her house. She hides them out. And when they come to ask, where are they? She gives them a story. You know how lies are. Some people tell lies. It's a yes or no answer. You know, well, okay, you don't know if it's true or not. But some people like to fabricate. Some people like to embellish the lie. When we were growing up, we call them storytellers. You know, she told a story. She told a fib. They told a story. The midwives, they were storytellers. They told him, you know what? Not only did we not do what you told, what you told us to do, we made sure that we didn't even go into the presence of these midwives. I mean, of these people. He didn't tell, they didn't tell him that. They just said, oh, they have babies so quick. They have babies so fast. And I know that the team that was working with them, they had to have midwives all over the country making sure that they were doing what the king said. And they got the word across that none of us, none of us are going to do what the king said. Not one child. They came in unity. They came in oneness. They had one mindset that we were going to do what God called us to do. Why? Because they feared God. Hallelujah. They feared God. Rahab didn't know God, but she trusted the God that they served, and she lied. Praise God. And she saved. Hallelujah. Another nation. Glory to God. We look at Esther. Esther said, you know what? If I perish, let me perish, but I'm going to see the king. Esther made up in her mind that I am going to make sure that I am going to be a destiny changer. I'm going to make sure that I am not going to allow, hallelujah, my nation to be defeated, my nation to be taken out. Glory to God. And we have to be the same way, women and men of God. We have to be generation changers. We need to make sure and make up in our mind that we are going to serve the true and living God. And when God gives us an assignment, that we stay true to that assignment, that we don't back down because of fear of man, that we don't back down because of the pressures of the world. We got to make sure that we continue to press forward. If we are fearing God, God has our back. Glory to God. He has are back. Hallelujah. You know, we don't have to lie. You know, we do tell lies. Um, how many of y'all here ain't never told a lie? Okay, good, because y'all be lying. You know, we lie. We lie. Sometimes we lie because we have to lie. When the cops stop us, we don't want no ticket. The cops stop us, guess what? I wasn't speeding, sir. I wasn't speeding. You know you were speeding because they got the little thing in their car that indicates that you were speeding. We lie to our bosses when we don't want to go to work. I don't feel good. My daughter got to play. This, 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 this. We lie to our husbands when we don't feel like it. We lie to our neighbors, our families and friends, and we don't want to pick up that phone. We look at that phone and we like, mm-mm, not today. When we don't answer that phone, they call us. Oh, I know you called. We lie. We lie. <laughs> we go to the urgent care. We don't go to our doctors. We go to urgent care. Because we can lie to urgent care. Our doctor got our history. And we lie to urgent care so we can get an excuse out of not going to work. Glory to God. 
We lied, our professors and our teachers, oh, I didn't finish my assignment because this, this, this happened. And so those seem to be little innocent lies, right? Get us out of trouble. We lied to our pastors. <laughs> we lied to our pastors. We don't want to serve in a particular capacity. God's not leading me to do that anymore. But we don't tell the pastors. We tell everybody else, I'm not led. The Lord is leading me to do something different. Lie. We rarely tell God a lie, though. <laughs> we just lie on him. The Holy Spirit told me. Oh, okay. The Holy Spirit said. The Holy Spirit is not leading me. We don't lie to God, but we lie on God. Then we lie to ourselves. <laughs> How do we lie to ourselves? We lie to ourselves because we believe what the devil says about us. And as a result, we stay in a place of defeat. We stay in a place of, of, of just being all bent out of shape because we listen to the lies of the devil that tell us that we're not going to make it, that tell us everybody's against us, that tell us this or tell us that. We believe that lie. And so we are lying to ourselves because we say that the word of the Lord, we see that the word of the Lord tells us exactly who we are. We are the apple of God's eye. We have been created in his image. We are sons and daughters of the most high God. We are, hallelujah, game changers. But we can't see that because the enemy has us blinded because he's lying to us and we receive the lie. Mm. These women, they took a risk. Their lives to defy civil authority. They took a risk. In this day and this hour, y'all, we got to be willing to take a risk. We got to be willing to step out and do what God told us to do. It may not be popular. It may not get your name in lights. It may not cause you to be invited here, there, and everywhere. But the true work of God, the true work of God is done when nobody sees it. When God calls you to speak to powers that be in place, to speak to the truth of what's going on in our community. When God uses you to speak forth life to dead situations, you are now a game changer. You are on assignment by God to change a generation, to change a destiny. When you teach in the schools, you are a game changer. You don't have to have a big title. If you teach in the schools in this time and age, you are a game changer. And you ought to be celebrated this morning. Hallelujah. If you are an intercessor, you may not be called to the nations. You may not be called to the boardrooms. You may not be called here or there. But if you are an intercessor, you are everywhere because your prayers super exceed the natural. Your prayers hit straight to heaven and you are a game changer. You are a game changer. They took a chance. They took a risk. You see, they made a decision to abort man's plan. They made a decision to abort man's plan to sustain God's purposes. They understood not only the birthing process, but they understood timing. Say they understood timing. They were women of courage in the midst of fear. What does it mean to have courage? Courage is the ability to do something brave out of the motivation of the heart. You have courage when you do something out of the motivation of your heart. Not because somebody tells you to do it. Not because you really want to do it. But you do it out of your heart. The motivation of your heart is what causes you to be courage, courageous. It causes you to be brave. Glory to God. Courage also is called bravery and valor. It is the choice and willingness to confront agony. Courage is the choice and willingness to confront pain, to confront danger, to confront uncertainty or intimidation. Physical courage is bravery in the face of physical pain, hardship, even death or the threat of death. Glory to God. While moral courage is the ability to act right in the face of popular opposition. How many of you all are not afraid to speak truth to power? You know, you may not go up in the White House. You may not go in your local legislative body. But you do have schools. 
You do have children that attend schools that have boards that legislate and make sure that the processes of our schools are done correctly. You have a voice to advocate for the children. You have a voice to advocate for the elderly. You have a voice to advocate. Power is anyone that has any rule over you. Any rule over your children. It's time that we rise up and we be a voice, glory to God. We've got to be a voice to see change, glory to God. God is saying, I'm calling for game changes. I'm calling for people that will make a change for a generation. It's not about you. Some of us be pounding mad and frustrated because we want to be used by God. Allow God to use you where you are. Are you a game changer on your job? Are you a game changer in your community? Are you a game changer? In the midst of this perverse and dark generation, our children, our youth are in trouble. We can't keep hiding. We can't keep saying, you know what, I'm just going to turn the news off. It's too much bad news. They need help. And if you can't do anything else, if you can't use your voice to go to advocate, you can use your voice to pray. You can use your voice to cry out to God. Y'all ain't liking this message. It's okay. These women fear God more than the unnamed Pharaoh in Exodus who could have easily just killed them. Generation changes don't, are not concerned about death. They're not concerned about their life. They know that in him, they live, they move, and they have their being. They know that in order to live, you got to die anyway. In order to live, you got to die. In order to prosper, you have to die in God's kingdom. In order to be blessed and raised up, you got to die. Not a physical death. They understood destiny. They understood the plan of God. They recognized the significance of what was going on in that hour. They had courage. They were gap bearers. Any <laughs> gap bearers in the house? They stood in the gap between the mother and the enemy that wanted to abort their children. They were protectors of destiny. <laughs> they were time wise. They recognized and understood that I've been called for such a time as this. And if I perish, let me perish. We know Esther said that, but I'm sure they were thinking the same thing. Amen. To stand before authority and rulers means that you are able to be a game changer. Yes. Glory to God. So there is a call to action. It is a time that we learn to put our trust in him. See, a lot of times we can't be the game changers we want to be because we have our own fears. We have our own things that keep us hindered, that keep us bound, that keep us from moving forward in the things of God. God is saying, you know what? You got to put your trust in me. You got to fear me. He's our helper. Hallelujah. He's our source. Glory to God. He's our provider. Hallelujah. He's our deliverer. Glory to God. He is our sustainer. He is our way maker. He is our keeper. He is our will in the middle of a will. He is our rock. He is our fortress. He is everything we need him to be. Glory to God. Who? Glory to God. He is our sustainer. He keeps us in the midst or when we're in hard circumstances, when we don't think we're going to make it through. God says, I will sustain you. I will keep you. All we, he asks us to do is keep our minds stayed on him. He said, I will keep you in perfect peace. No matter what you're going through, keep your mind on him. Don't let the enemy get you sidetracked. Every time you allow the enemy to sidetrack you, to steal your praise, to steal your joy, guess what? You step back two or three steps, and God is right here saying, you know what? Why are you back there? I'm right here. I'm walking with you. I'm with you in the midst of your trial, in the midst of your struggle, in the midst of your hardship. I'm right with you. He said, I won't leave you. I won't forsake you. Those midwives knew that God was with them. They feared God. They knew God. He was right there with them. That he gave them the answer to speak. Hallelujah. Wasn't the truth. But it did something. Pharaoh never asked a question. Pharaoh never asked a question. You know why? Because when God tells you to do something, when you do something because you fear him, God will protect you. He shut the mouth 
of the ruler of the nation. He had nothing else to say. The Bible says that the hand of the king, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it whichever way he wants. I'm here to tell you whatever circumstance you're facing today, whatever trial you're facing today, if there's somebody over you, somebody hindering you, guess what? Their heart is in God's hand. And all you got to do is pray. All you got to do is fear God and love God and watch God turn that thing around. Come on, give God praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. There is a call to action. There's a bigger picture in everything that God has called us to do. And we fear because we don't know what the big picture is. We can't see it all. But the big picture is calling for you to just step out in faith. There's no fear in faith. He said, God says, we can't allow fear to stagnate us. We can't allow fear to hinder our call, our purpose in this hour. We fear so many different things. We do. We just have so many fears and we don't even recognize it. In this season, we fear fear and disease and fear of the pandemic, fear of sickness, fear of isolation, fear of being lonely for the single women. We fear being lonely, fear of bad news when our children are out and about, especially when they grow, mother kind. We worry about them more as adults, and sometimes we fear bad news coming. We fear sudden disaster. We see all around us disaster is happening, tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes. And deep down inside, we have a fear of that natural disaster, maybe one day touching our families or touching us. Fear of anxiety, fear of being overwhelmed. You know, you can have a fear of being overwhelmed, fear of rejection, You don't have to fear rejection. We fight a lot with rejection. I fought with rejection. The Bible says that we are accepted of the beloved. And when we can embrace that, that we are accepted of the beloved. It don't matter if the person to the left of you or the person on the right to you don't like you, don't talk to you, don't care about you. It don't matter. Because God... He loves you with an unconditional love. He loves you just the way you are. All of your flaws. Rahab was a prostitute. She wasn't serving God, but guess what? Her name went down in history. You can find her name in the New Testament. God was so pleased with her faith and what she had done that she got favor with God. Stop trying to be perfect. Stop thinking you got to be up here somewhere before God can use you. That's a lie of the devil. You just walk in faith. Step out in faith. Believe God. You know, I've, I've worked for the airlines for 37 years. For those of you all don't know, I retired. In 2020, I took that package. And there were times flying on that airplane that when the turbulence came, I was used to it. You know, they tell you on the plane to make sure you buckle up, okay? Fasten your seatbelt, because the turbulence, when it comes, if you're in your seatbelt, you're not gonna get tossed all around the plane, because that happens. When you have your seatbelt on and you're secure, then you're not gonna be tossed around. But sometimes the turbulence can be so brutal, can be so hard, can be so scary, that you almost think that you're gonna lose your life. There have been many times that I've been like, okay, this is it, Lord. You know, I needed to do this, this, this. And, and I just thought, today is the day. It was a fear. I'm just being real. I was in my seatbelt, harness on, in the back. And I thought, this plane is not going to make it. People are fearful all around you. You're trying to decide and um, go in your head what you learn in class so you can go forth and do what you need to do to get the people off the plane. Your mind sometimes just goes there. I had us on the ground, you know, in fire, fire trucks, what I was going to do when the ambulance came. All these stories going on in my head. 
But how many of y'all know that when we trust in God, he is our security. He's like our seatbelt. Praise God. And sometimes we just have to pull it a little bit tighter. Glory to God. We got to seek him a little bit more so we can make sure that we are not moved by the waves and the winds and the circumstances and the trials that we so face every day in our lives. He's our refuge. <laughs> he is our strength. He is a very present help in the time of trouble. You know, on the prayer line, sometimes you ask Elder Mother Khan, how is she doing? I'm blessed and thankful, and the Lord is helping me. And she says that. And so many places in the Word, as I was studying, it says that the Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. And it just blew up on the inside of me. That when I'm weak, he's strong. When I can't, he can. And sometimes we go through things. We're like, I prayed, I prayed, I prayed. God didn't do this. God didn't do that. Guess what? He's still right there. He allows you to fail sometimes. He allows you to go through things sometimes so that you can be strengthened. You can't be a real game changer if you just become a wimp and a punk. You can't be no game changer every time you just have go through something, you pouting and crying. God says, no, I've called you to be a game changer. Once you get through this, once you pass the test, once you get this job, you will see who I am. Glory to God. You will see the impact that I have caused you to make in the place where you are. He's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. All God asks us to do is to fear him. Not to fear man, not to fear circumstances and all the things in our name, but to fear him. It means to be reverent when we fear the Lord. It means that we are living in a constant conscious awareness that we are in the presence of an almighty, awesome, amazing God. He is a game changer. <laughs> he is a shaker and a mover. Hallelujah. Our God is all powerful. He knows everything. And when we make a decision that we're going to live for him, Guess what? We have the same benefits. He allows us to walk alongside him. Glory to God. And we have much favor. We have power. He said, I've given you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Somebody say, all the power of the enemy. All the power of the enemy. All your fears, he's giving you power over. All of your heartaches, he's giving you power over. All of it. Glory to God. But you got to believe that. You got to believe who he says he is. <laughs> Woo, glory to God. Don't have any believers in the house. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Glory, glory, glory. Glory, 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 glory. Glory, hallelujah. It says, I guess in Psalms 46, he says, Be still, be still, and know that I am God. And I don't think he always means to just sit somewhere, don't move, don't do anything, cease from your labor, cease from your activities. Be still and know that I am God. 
That means take a pause and think about who I am. Think about what I've done. Think about my greatness. Think about how I am a deliverer. Think about everything you can think of about me. Until we do that, it's going to be hard for us to fear him. It's going to be hard for us to serve him. Because we are weak vessels. We need God. We need God. We need to understand that loving God with all of our hearts, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our being is our first mission. It's not going to and fro serving and doing this and doing that. It's loving God. It's loving God. The Word of God says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, I'm almost done. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do to the glory of God. Amen. How do we do that? How do we love God? How do we develop a reverence for Him, a fear for Him? We've got to love Him with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength. We have to recognize that God's wisdom is infinitely greater than any human wisdom. We have to trust Him more than we trust ourselves. We have to meditate on his word. We have to memorize his word. And I just have a problem with that because I would hear people quoting word left and right and just be as ornery and mean and, and, and just nasty. I'm like, why are you quoting the word like that? And you just mean. You got to get the word in you because when you get the word in you, the word will change you and you will become more like the word. You will be able to live out and act out the word. You just can't memorize it, but you have to meditate on it. When you meditate on it, you're thinking on it. You have to delight yourself in the Lord to trust him in all things. And then you got to praise him in everything. <laughs> you have to praise him in everything, I said. You have to acknowledge that he is the greatest, most precious gift on this earth nothing including riches luxuries our wildest dreams can compare to almighty God we have to ask God to help us to see the world as he sees it because when we ask God to see the world as he sees it then he will place us in positions in places that we can make a difference, that we can be his mouthpiece, that we can be his eyes, his ears, his hands to serve in the world, to be a game changer, to be a destiny builder. Come on, give God praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. You know, one thing that that um, midwife, she was something powerful. I just felt honored to have her to be my midwife. And even though she didn't see it to the very end, what she did and what she helped me to become was just priceless. And, and she invited me. I was really kind of young in the Lord. But she invited me to come to her home outside of being in her office and her, you know, talking to me and seeing how the baby was doing. She invited me to come to her home to pray with some of the most powerful spiritual women that I have ever been around. And I would sit there. They would sit for hours. <laughs> they would sit for hours in his presence and not say 
a word. That took some getting used to. And then they would open up a time to share what God was speaking, what God was saying. And I always seemed to have something to say. And I was seeing things that just... just blew me away. And so... I want us to get back to a place where we're still before God. I know our people that are retired, you have time to do that. I'm not talking just an hour. We set hours still before God. We need direction. We need to know where God is leading us next. We should not be complacent with being just right here in the now. It's more God has for us. And the only way we're going to know exactly what it is, is to sit in his presence. Spend time in his presence. So he can show you how he wants you to be a game changer in this time, in this season. Come on, give God praise. Amen. Ingrid, you have to do that more often. Hallelujah. Oh, we miss the fellowship. Hallelujah. Glory to God for our pastors. Hallelujah. But I want to stand with this morning just to um, encourage you and to advise you that um, I am in covenant with the living God. Um, I want to testify that I am a tithe and an offering giver. Amen. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. And I want to testify like David over in Psalms. Oh, in Psalms 37, he said that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. And though he fall, he shall not utterly be cast down and for the Lord upholds him with his hand. And then David went on to say that I've been young and now am I old. Hallelujah. But he's never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed beg bread. Hallelujah. I just want to stand this morning. I'm sorry, but it's just like fire shut up in my bones. Hallelujah. To tell you that I'm a tithe giver and my God has never forsaken me. I've never gone without. My children are covered. Hallelujah. My daughter, oh, a mother of three. Hallelujah. One with special needs. Hallelujah. My daughter, Oh, she struggled. A husband with, oh God, that was mentally disabled. Hallelujah. God brought her up from the ashes. She just graduated nursing school. on, But she hadn't graduated, but she finished nursing school on Friday. Hallelujah. So I'm just giving God all the glory today. I'm just excited about who he is and what he's done in my life. David says over in the psalm, and I'm just saying a part of it. He says, what shall I render unto the Lord for all? All his benefits towards me. What ten dollars could I give God? What hundred dollars could I give God? The God who owns everything. Hallelujah. So I'm just encouraging you this morning. We declare over this house that Harvest Rain is a house of 100% tithe givers. We give to the Lord. We're cheerful givers at this house. So I'm just encouraging you now to prepare with your hearts. Prepare with your hearts. Not out of, not out of um, necessity or rigidness this or I give my one dollar I give my five dollar think and meditate on the goodness of God and bring forth an offering worthy of the king amen amen, amen. so if you would just stand with me if you um and there are several ways to give hallelujah I'm gonna do it right now I'm gonna do a text to give this morning hallelujah very easy to tithe in your offering. Just stand with me for a minute. Amen. The ushers are coming. God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Bless God.
Alleluia. the opportunity to give. Amen. Well, let's stretch our hands towards the tithe and the offering. Oh, gracious Father, we bless your name today, Lord God. We praise you always, Father. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord God, for everyone, Lord God, who has given into this ministry, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for we believe your word. You said give and it shall be given. Good measure pressed down, shaking together and running over. You will cause men to give into our bosom, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord God, that you are the great Jehovah Jireh. You are the provider, Lord God. You give seed to the sower. Father God, we thank you this morning that every need is supplied. Every need of this ministry, Lord God, every work for your kingdom, Lord God, is funded in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, for the addition of the balcony. We thank you, Lord God, for the renovations in the children's ministry. Oh God, nothing is too hard for you, Lord God. And we thank you for this people, Lord God, this blessed people who have given, Lord God, from the abundance of their hearts. We thank you, Lord God. Oh God, we thank you that every need is supplied. We give you glory. We give you honor. We pray, Lord God, that you multiply Lord God the seed sown and we give you glory we thank you for your faithfulness we thank you Lord God and we bless you in the mighty name of Jesus we pray amen and amen and amen hallelujah glory be to our God hallelujah.